Hi, I'm Jerry Pomper, professor of political science, uh, retired, uh, but still working. Uh, I've been at Rutgers since 1962 and formally at the Eagleton Institute since uh, 1981. I went to uh, Columbia for my undergraduate work and then I did my graduate work at Princeton. I came to Rutgers as my uh, second professional job in 1962 in the political science department. Uh, and, uh, you know, I knew about the Eagleton Institute as soon as I got here. Uh, Eagleton was a small coterie of people, didn't quite know what they did, uh, although they did serve a lot of liquor in those days. My formal affiliation began in 1981 uh, when I became half-time at Eagleton uh, and moved my office here from the political science department. Uh, I had been in the Rutgers College Department, which then existed as a separate entity, then I became the first chairman of the Livingston College Department, and then I became the first chairman of the Unified uh, Department uh, in the 1970s. I formally retired in 2001, but I've been teaching uh, here at Eagleton since then, uh, and continue to this day and still enjoy it. It's the first of a sequence of courses uh, that lead to an honor certificate for uh, Eagleton undergraduates. Uh, and uh, I have always called it, uh, the formal title is The Practice of Politics, uh, but the working title is The Politics of Choice. And uh, what I try to get the students to see is how political choices are made and uh, how difficult they are to make and, uh, and sometimes ambig ambivalent in their effects and then to get them to wrestle with those same kinds of choices. Uh, and a feature of the course is uh, dividing the students, usually about two dozen students, I divide them into three or four groups, and they work as groups on a series of problems. Uh, every week we deal with a very uh, different choice. Uh, it's not the same choice or, or a developed series. Uh, and the choices each year depend on what's interesting. Uh, but a couple that are there for most years. One is uh, the U.S. Constitution. Uh, I love the U.S. Constitution. And uh, typically, I give a talk on how the Constitution was made, the politics of the Constitutional Convention, the compromises and the maneuvering, and so on. Uh, and then and they read the Federalist Papers uh, as part of that. And then for the second half of the course, uh, of the class that day, I divide them into these groups, and each group has to consider a proposed constitutional amendment and how they would treat it if they were writing the Constitution today, and if they were the James Madisons and the Alexander uh, Hamiltons or the Alexandra Hamiltons, now that we have women also making decisions. Uh, and then they have to defend it to, to their classmates and uh, consider the arguments. So I try to get them as if they were making decisions. That's a historical example. Another one I try to use each year is to get them to balance the federal budget. Uh, and, uh, and they have to do it within three hours. Again, dividing them into these groups. Uh, and somehow they succeed. Uh, I wrote an op-ed recently uh, when the federal government was having its trouble and saying, look, my students uh, balance the federal budget in three hours. Why is it that Congress can't do this in three years? <laughs> I think what they have to get is the ending the separation between theory and practice. And places like Eagleton could fall into the trap of saying we deal with practical politics and the ideas of politics are in the political science department. And I think that's uh, bad for both ends, uh, that ideas about politics that are not tested by practice tend to become arid and there is some aridity in political science, pure abstraction in some areas. And I think practice that just goes on and let's just strike a deal or, you know, uh, see what we can uh, do without any thought of the idea behind it, what are you trying to accomplish, what's the philosophical basis, uh, is also bad. And so what I think Eagleton at its best does, and, and I try to do in my course, is to say, 
ideas in, should inform practice, practice should inform ideas, and my example of that is to go back to the Constitutional Convention, which I, I just love because it keeps switching. People there really were smart uh, and really did their reading and uh, so on, and there was less of it to do in those days. But they were also practical politicians. Most of the people there had been in a state legislature. Uh, and you could see that in the debates and discussions that they're bringing practice and they're also talking. And they can switch you know, from one paragraph uh, to another uh, at the same time. That's what, you know, they're not, my students are not gonna end up in too many constitutional conventions. But in their active lives as citizens, and many of them will be in politics, I hope that's what they uh, can get out of it. And the other thing I think I, I try to promote uh, in them is when you're in politics, uh, you can't just be ideological if you want to accomplish something. It requires compromise, it requires respect for other positions and so forth. And, uh, and that's what I think they learn in these groups. They really learn to, uh, to like each other. Three years ago, I had absolutely the best undergraduate class I ever had. Eagleton, and, so uh, and there were a number of reasons for that. But a thing that happened at the end of it, really, uh, I will remember, uh, in this class I had an arch conservative, uh, a Jewish kid who was writing, uh, and he's well known nationally, I won't mention names, uh, but a very smart guy, uh, but far on the right. And I had a Jordanian or an American, uh, Arab American of Jordanian descent, uh, uh, who was a Muslim, uh, and far to the left. And I don't mean particularly on Middle East issues, but just on American issues. And these two became very good friends. <laughs> and when the Jewish kid had a sudden gallbladder attack uh, that took him out of class, an emergency surgery, and um, uh, he, was, he couldn't participate in the end of the year project because he was flat on his back. Uh, this Muslim kid and the other people in his group did his work for him, were taking notes for him, and uh, you know, and uh, even though he wasn't participating in the end, they said they want their grade, him to get the same grade they get, and so on. And it was just wonderful. Uh, you know, they were intellectually cooperative, but even more. Uh, they develop respect for each other, despite these huge differences, political and uh, ethnically. The reason that class three years ago was wonderful is that the world was giving me examples every week. <laughs> and so a uh, basic question in the course is, what makes power legitimate? Right? A very important issue. Uh, and we talk about that the first day even. And what was happening in 2011 was the Arab Spring. And you know, new governments were popping up, were being deposed, and the question in those uh, revolts was the legitimacy of power. So I wasn't just talking about you know, a German uh, sociologist of 100 years ago, that, which I was talking about, but I was talking about, look what's in today's headline. Well, what makes Egypt, the Egyptian government, legitimate or illegitimate? Uh, where does power come from? Uh, so that would be one week. Uh, and then the Affordable Care Act was passed. Well, that told us everything you wanted to know about how American politics works. Uh, and the uh, presidential campaign of 2012 was developing. And so we have a week on voting behavior. Well, here it is, uh, real. Or uh, there was a Supreme Court decision on um, whether or not an extremist religious group could disrupt a military funeral uh, with their, it's called uh, Snyder v. Phelps. Uh, the decision of the Supreme Court came out the week before we were reading John Stuart Mill on the limits of free speech, uh, and, uh, or should there be limits. So this was happening all year. And I, and, you know, a professor of political science could want nothing more but than for what he is saying, teaching to be relevant to what's happening. And the world's doing this for me every week. <laughs> so, uh, and I, that's what I'd like the students to see, that what they're doing is relevant to what's happening. And the world doesn't always cooperate in this nice way, you know, but it did happen then. 
it's not an academic uh, moment, uh, but it's a, it's a very dear moment uh, to me. And uh, yeah, I would like to share it. Uh, I, uh, last year, just about uh, almost a year ago, uh, my wife died uh, unexpectedly. She had not been uh, seriously ill. Uh, and this was, um, as you can probably hear in my voice even now, uh, a very deeply emotional, sad moment. Uh, and there were many people who, you know, provided uh, solace, sympathy. Uh, but the dearest uh, support, other than my family, uh, came from former Eagleton uh, students, uh, my undergraduates, uh, the previous year and for two years, uh, the class two years earlier than that. Uh, and they called me, some of them called me and said they want to come over and see me. Uh, and uh, one night, uh, it must have been, less than a month after she had died. Uh, four of them came over to my house. They wanted to go out to dinner. I said, no, you come over to my house and we'll talk, we'll have dinner, bring in food. I'll show you my, you know, my house and my wife and the photographs and so on. And uh, it was just a wonderful moment. Uh, they were supportive. Uh, they weren't maudlin uh, or anything. Uh, some of them had met my wife, but uh, they were there to support me. And uh, I've continued to see some of those students. Uh, so they're taking care of me. So that's a, a, an Eagleton-inspired moment. Uh, I'd be happy to have people uh, contact me, and you know, and uh, we can talk and write. And it's so easy these days. Uh, I warn you, I am not on Facebook or Twitter, so you have to write to me. It's uh, gpomper at rci.rutgers.edu. But uh, yeah, let's get in touch. Mm -hmm.